Mais comme en témoignent les images que vous venez de voir, je peux voir que c'était intense hier soir au Forum de Montréal. Je pense que ça va être très intense. Je me disais, Geneviève, qu'il y a peut-être deux sortes de fans de Metallica. Il y a la première génération très fidèle qui suit le groupe depuis ses débuts. Puis il y a peut-être une, une nouvelle génération oui. qui est là depuis certaines tonnes comme Enter Sandman, qui sont vraiment des tonnes écœurantes, bien, vraiment ça. très bonnes. Et puis Metallica a comme réussi à se surclasser par rapport à tout ce qu'il y a comme groupe rock sur le marché. Puis à Montréal, on peut dire qu'ils ont été fidèles à leurs paroles. Ils ont été consistants dans ce qu'ils ont dit. Ils ont dit oui. qu'ils reviendraient et ils sont venus. Mais tu sais, ça me fait penser parce que Lars Ulrich m'expliquait hier que souvent ils donnent des entrevues à la radio, disons, euh, aux États-Unis, dans les petites villes. Et puis les gens, les animateurs, lui disent euh, Ton premier album est, est excellent, Enter Sandman, Wherever I'm Wrong, c'est très bon. Est quand est-ce qu'on va, est qu va avoir un deuxième album <rire> Il y a plusieurs personnes qui, qui ont découvert Metallica juste avec à le dernier de album. Ouais. Et toi, hier soir, tu as eu la chance de, ben, enfin, pas de découvrir, mais je veux dire d'être très près d'eux parce que oui, c'était dans oui. ce qu'on appelle le, le Snake Pit, oui, le, sur le, la, scène. la fosse au serpent, qui était un espace spécialement aménagé sur la scène pour 50 chouchous privilégiés. Ça, Et tu avec... étais une des chouchous ouais. privilégiés. Raconte ça comment ça s'est passé. avec 50 chanceux sur la scène. Et c'est carrément sur la scène, c'est que ça, ça creuse un peu. On, on est là, en plein milieu du groupe. On est euh, à côté du batteur, derrière le chanteur James Edfield. Et il y a aussi une passerelle au-dessus de nous. Alors, euh, les, les musiciens se promènent sur nos têtes, comme ça. On est vraiment proche parce que les, euh, les membres de Metallica peuvent nous taper dans les mains. Euh, C'est là qu'ils changent de guitare. On est vraiment à côté de tout ça, en plein milieu de l'action. Et puis le son est, est très bon sur la scène. Il y a eu des commentaires oui, partagés. Oui, des commentaires à partager. Fois... Évidemment, ça dépend où tu es assis au forum. Oui, c'est C'est sûr vrai. que c'est dans le pit en haut d'un blanc que tu ne peux pas avoir le même niveau de son que si tu es rouge 210. Ça, c'est, je pense, oui. dans n'importe quel spectacle au monde, c'est toujours comme ça. Puis ce pas facile d'avoir la bonne qualité de son partout. Mais, Mais en général, est-ce que là... c'est bon les commentaires pour le son en général? Oui, en donc? général, oui. oui. Sur la scène, c'est excellent. Tu as, as les moniteurs, le son est très bon. Et puis tout ça, c'est filmé. Ils ont plusieurs caméras. Et puis, euh, quand on est sur la scène, il y a aussi une caméra, donc on peut voir euh, le chanteur, parce que s'il est, si est en avant, on peut pas le voir chanter. Alors, ça nous permet de, de bien voir euh, tout ça. Je pense que tu aimes Metallica. Je pense que j'adore Metallica. que tu as un petit béguin pour Metallica. Metallica. Et à ne pas manquer, tout à l'heure, Geneviève aura le plaisir de s'entretenir avec des membres du groupe, ici même, dans nos studios. Et euh, pendant qu'on parle, il y a déjà plusieurs centaines de personnes à l'extérieur de la station euh, qui viennent voir à travers les vitres ce qui se passe à l'intérieur. Et je vous invite à venir faire un tour. Il a cessé de neiger en ce moment. Il y a deux stations de métro pas loin. Il y a Saint-Laurent, il y a berry ucam Vous pouvez venir nous voir. On a installé des speakers dehors pour que vous puissiez entendre ce qui se passe à l'intérieur. Et on va passer une très belle après-midi. Oui, tu t'as oublié pas l'édition spéciale de Solid Rock aussi cet après-midi à 5h30. Oui. Une heure Solid Rock. Oui, on va décrasser les haut-parleurs. On va <rire> poursuivre cet événement Metallica sur les ondes de Music Plus avec Whenever I May Roam. Le batteur de Metallica vient de faire son entrée à Musique Plus. Il est allé déposer son manteau. On va le maquiller un petit peu, puis il s'en vient dans quelques secondes. Vous allez pouvoir qu'il y avait une banane et un perrier à la main. Très santé. Alors, si vous voulez parler, alors vous voudrez lui poser des questions. Vous pouvez composer le 7900123, le 7900234, si vous êtes dans la région de Montréal. Et si vous appelez de l'extérieur de Montréal, composez le 1-800-567-5656. Lars Ulrich va passer la prochaine heure avec nous. Il y a des gens en studio qui vont lui poser des questions. Il y a des gens à l'extérieur aussi qui vont lui poser des questions. Alors, pour tout de suite, on regarde Enter Sandman. Vous êtes à l'écoute de Musique Plus immédiatement après cette pause commerciale. Vous serez à l'écoute de la seule télévision qui obtient une entrevue en direct avec un des membres de Metallica, Lars Ulrich. Mesdames et Messieurs, accueillez Lars Ulrich de Metallica tout de suite. Microphone for you. Uh, I don't need one. No. You can interview me. Okay. 
you, John? Yeah. All right. Hello. So, I was to the concert last night. You kept your promise. Metallica came back to Montreal and at a very special price. And I think we had a lot for our money. It was almost three hours long. It was uh, great. Yeah. We, uh, we like to uh, deliver. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, it... Um, as you guys probably know from when we played indoors here in 91, we've changed some things around. We've added some different songs, taken some of the long-winded solos out and so on. But um, it's a set that we've been playing for the last few weeks, and it feels really good. And like you say, it's about three hours long, and hopefully tonight we'll get a chance to do a few different things. We'll mm -hmm. see. And uh, mm -hmm. we always try when we do two, two shows in the same city to switch things around. It'll shut up! <laughs> 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 and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, just try and switch things around a little bit and so on. So it, um, but it was a good start last night, and um, I think tonight hopefully should be even better. Mm. I have to translate this. Oh, okay. okay. Alors, euh, ben, Lars disait que le spectacle d'hier soir en effet a duré trois heures et de, depuis quelques semaines leurs spectacles sont longs comme ça. Et ils espèrent pouvoir faire quelque chose de différent aussi ce soir. And you always uh, make different things. I like the the backstage live uh, when you talk uh, to the people. You like. Uh, doing that you're really comfortable and we can discover slowly the people in the loge like all the, the guys in the talk well we just we wanted to do things differently um, the whole idea of not having a support act obviously was to try and and you know for us just to sort of turn the house lights off and then go out here we are Metallica high that wouldn't be great so we're trying to create an atmosphere that sets up us coming out on stage in the same way that a, a support act does, you know, that gets the kids warmed up and so on. So with this half hour movie and try to do some different things with a live camera, there's so many possibilities and I think that a lot of, of rock bands have not really explored a lot of that. So just having the camera backstage, everybody can see us getting warmed up and, and doing our exercise and getting my arm worked on and so on is a, is a very unique thing and it's a lot of fun for Metallica to always um, do things just dabble in, in, in areas that nobody else has dabbled in before. Try and translate dabble into French. <laughs> That, that's a very good challenge. I think I'll, I'll start with what I can. Alors, euh, vous savez, derrière la scène, en direct, avant le spectacle, Lars et les autres membres du groupe parlent à la caméra au public avant d'entrer en scène. Et puis là, on peut voir euh, James Hetfield et euh, Kirk Hammett qui jouent un petit peu de guitare, ou euh, Lars qui fait des blagues, ou euh, Jason qui fait des exercices. Ils ont toujours aimé faire des choses euh, différentes et explorer des, des, des choses que pas beaucoup de groupes peuvent faire. Same thing for the snake. Was that, whose idea was it? Um, that came around really more by default than anything else. Um, you know, we had the stage and the design of the stage and knew, you know, the dimensions and everything like that. And then we realized in rehearsals and stuff that we would probably be playing out to the sides all the time. So we'd spend most of our time, you know, out on the edges of the stage. And there was this big sort of just dead space in the middle of the stage what are we going to do in there so we suggested maybe you know have some you know inflatables or stupid stuff like that but um our manager and i have to give him credit here <laughs> not often but i will give him credit now that he, <laughs> he actually came up with the idea of uh, basically carving out like an area in the middle of the stage and basically putting like 100 150 fans in there you'd give away you know, the tickets on the radio stations and on TV shows and, and so on and um, just put some of the diehard fans in there, walk around in the arena, give the tickets out to people like have really old Kill 'em All shirts on and stuff like that. And, uh, yeah, just like our that. friends and yeah, you know, just, but what happened is, is in the beginning we couldn't really police it very well so, you know, we had all the business people in there, you could tell all the people from the record companies and all our managers, friends standing around looking very frightened, you know, but uh, get rid of these people, put some of the real fans in there, some of the kids in there, so it's worked out real well now and I, I still think that it's the most unique an unusual place anywhere to see a, a rock show from and it's uh it really brings you right into the face of, of, of us and what's going on it's, it's a lot of fun alors, ils ont aussi le Snake Pit. Il y a 50 personnes qui peuvent être sur la scène avec Metallica. J'étais là hier soir. Est vraiment, on est vraiment dans l'action. On voit les guitaristes échanger de guitare et tout ça. Et je lui demandais de, comment cette idée-là était venue. Puis il dit, ben, je peux rarement donner du crédit à mon gérant. Mais euh, cette fois-ci, ça a été son idée. Au début, c'était plus par défaut parce qu'on ne savait pas comment utiliser l'espace au milieu. Mais euh, finalement, eh ben, euh, c'est ça. Il y a des chanceux qui peuvent être là à chacun de leurs spectacles. On va prendre une question à l'extérieur. Paul, il y a quelqu'un avec toi? Oui, absolument. Merci Geneviève. Alors, ton nom? 
Pascal. Alors, Pascal, c'est quoi ta question? J'aimerais savoir, c'est quel tune qui aime mieux jouer, là, celle qui donne plus d'entrain à jouer? Là. Uh, Lars, uh, Pascal is asking, what is the song you prefer playing? Um, for me, it's usually whatever one we're playing at the time. I don't really have a favorite one. I think um, I, I like playing all of them. Some of them are challenging in, in a way that uh, playing, the, for instance, the Justice Melody has a lot of starts and stops and stops, so you really got to you know, keep on it. That's challenging. Some of the songs like Sad But True is a lot of fun to just get into the groove and seek and destroy. And For Whom the Bell Tolls are songs that kind of just go. You don't have to think so much about them because we played them, obviously thousands of times um i really like playing all of them um i'm searching here in my mind if there are any of them i don't really like playing that much um no pretty much all of them sorry <laughs> <laughs> alors ben là j'ai pas vraiment une chanson préférée qui préfère jouer en spectacle c'est sad but true aussi qu'elle destroy c'est des chansons très intéressantes à jouer mais il n'y a pas vraiment une chanson favorite on va prendre une question au téléphone maintenant qui est au bout du fil allô oui allô? Bonjour. Allô. Bonjour. Bonjour. Ça va bien? Bonjour. Ça va bien? Oui, oui. Oh. <rire> qui, est, qui parle? C'est Marie-Louise. Bonjour Marie-Louise, c'est une question pour Lars? Oui, uh, how many times you play drums? How many times have I played drums? Not enough. <rire> um, Qu'est-ce que tu veux dire Marie-Louise? <rire> combien de temps, euh, ça combien de temps, temps qu'il qu joue? Qu joue du drum? Ok, je veux dire combien de temps ça fait que tu joues du drum? C'est pas encore assez. Non, um... <rire> yeah. Let's see, what are we now, 93? Yep. Um, about 15. <laughs> <laughs> Marie-Louise, ça fait 15 ans que Lars joue, mais ça veut dire que ça fait pas assez longtemps. It's pretty, pretty frightening based on, on last night's performance, believe me. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that was an in-joke, so. <laughs> All right. Alors, Marie-Louise, merci. Je merci d'avoir appelé. On va prendre une question à l'intérieur aussi. Salut. Someone sitting beside you. Oh my God! How you doing, Lars? I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Waking up on live TV is always fun. <laughs> Got a question for you. This is going to take you back in the old days. Remember the old days? Who is he? Yeah. He's a my name is Sebastian. Hi. Sebastian. Hello. Hello. Okay. Remember when before you did the album Kill 'Em All, when you were still with uh, Dave Mustaine? Mm. Did you ever come out with a uh, with a song called They'll Make You Wish? <laughs> <laughs> huh? I heard a song that it sounds like you're playing. It sounds like it sounds exactly like you guys. Oh. The only thing is the singing. It's it sounds like uh, Dave Mustaine. Well, you never no. came out with the song. There was some um, a couple of tracks that we did on some demos that were cover songs. One was called Let It Loose. Uh, the other one was called Killing Time, which surfaced on uh, the B side of one of the singles. Excuse me while I burp on this <laughs> album and. Uh, Uh, Mustaine actually, just to set the record straight, I mean, Mustaine was never on Kill 'Em All. He helped write some of the songs, but he never played on Kill 'Em All. But as far as I can remember, there was never any song that was recorded with him singing. Um, like I said, there's a very old demo that's floating around that had three songs that had Hit the Lights, Let It Loose, and Killing Time. And uh, Let, Let It Loose is probably the only song from the old days that we covered that we still haven't put on one of the uh, B-sides in the last few years, so maybe that's the one you're referring to. Could be. Could be. C'était quoi le titre encore? What was the title uh, you were saying? Well, I was... Uh, <laughs> never mind. You're you're right. Right. Alors, uh, ben, Sébastien, Sébastien uh, essayait de savoir s'il y avait une chanson uh, qui avait pu être enregistrée à l'époque de Kill Em All avec Dave Mustaine. Lars a dit Dave Mustaine n'était pas là à l'époque de Kill Em All. Et puis, uh, bon, je pense que... Je pense que Lars a répondu à sa question. On va prendre une pause commerciale et on revient tout de suite après avec Lars Ulrich de Metallica. En studio avec Lars Ulrich, le batteur de Metallica, qui répond à nos questions toujours, qui passe l'heure avec nous. Lars, do you remember yourself being a fan and running after somebody for an autograph? Yourself, when you were younger? Yeah, I still do. <laughs> you still do? Yeah. Um, no, I mean, in terms of, of this thing of being a fan, I mean, we're still, all four of us are still very much fans of, of, of the music that we obviously idol, I mean, adore and idolize. I'm still very, I'm probably the biggest fan of Alice in Chains anywhere in the world. You know, I'd run after them all the time if I wasn't Metallica myself, which at the moment drives the other three guys crazy. Alice in Chains, Alice in Chains, you know, shut up, Lars. But, um, 
Yeah, I mean, in terms of being a fan and so on, I don't think that that's something that you, um, uh, you know, lose. Yeah, stop being just because you grow older, just because, I mean, all this success happens to you. I'm still, in terms of, when you talk about bands from the 70s that I grew up with, from Deep Purple to Thin Lizzy to ACDC to UFO to all those bands, I'm still very big fans of those. What's great about being in Metallica and, and what's going on with Metallica now is that you get a chance to meet a lot of these people on in their eyes the same level i mean to me it's like when i met richie blackmore a couple years ago it's like Wah. you know i'm meeting richie blackmore but we were it was because we were playing with him do you know what i mean so it's great being in a band like this and then getting a chance to because you're in the band meeting a lot of these people on what some people would consider a parallel you know but i mean to me i'm still just a big fan of a lot of these people i don't think that that's anything that then i'll ever stop being i mean i used to sit around in Copenhagen back in the 70s outside you know uh, Rainbow's Hotel and there was this one hotel where all the bands played the Plaza uh, all the bands stayed the Plaza Hotel I used to sit there all you know the next days after the show and wait for these people to come out and, and that's for yeah, yeah yeah it was great alors je demandais à Lars s'il se rappelle d'avoir déjà été un fan et d'avoir couru après son idole pour avoir un autographe. Il dit qu'il est encore un fan et en particulier il adore le groupe Alice in Chains. D'ailleurs il voulait qu'Alice in Chains fasse la première partie des spectacles de Metallica sur cette tournée-ci. Et puis euh, il dit que ce qui est vraiment très spécial aujourd'hui, c'est que même si c'est très populaire, il rencontre euh, ses idoles, les gens qu'il a, qu a admirés. Et puis maintenant euh, il sent qu'il qu est sur le même niveau. Ben, lui il se sent impressionné, mais ces gens-là lui parlent euh, au même niveau. Et il se rappelle d'avoir été un grand fan, euh, entre autres, de Led Zeppelin et de Deep Purple dans les années euh, 70. Et aussi à, quand il était à Copenhague, il y avait un hôtel où il allait souvent parce que les, les groupes allaient toujours là après le spectacle. Et il espérait toujours en rencontrer euh, quelques-uns et puis euh, avoir un autographe. Alors on va prendre une question à l'extérieur. Qui est là? Merci beaucoup Geneviève. Alors euh, c'est quoi ton nom? Eric Chounard. Eric de quel endroit? Gaspé. Ok Eric, c'est quoi ta question? J'aimerais savoir si euh, le prochain album va plus élevé ou pas dans quelle orientation qu'ils veulent faire. Ok, uh, Lars, he wants to know what direction you're going to take for the next album. Is it going to be more, more speed, more heavy? What, what direction are you going to take for the next record? Uh, jazz fusion. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, what was his name? Eric? 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 From Gaspé? From Gaspé. Uh, what, what's your name? Oh, yeah. Eric. <laughs> Eric from Gaspé. <laughs> I'll, I'll look that up when I get back to the hotel. Um, I, right now, I really don't know. Uh, we still have about six months left of touring to do. I think our, our main object right now is just staying alive for the rest of the tour. Um, the never ending. Yeah. <laughs> we're the kind of band that really don't spend a lot of time um, on the road dealing with, you know, new songs and new, you know, let's sit and get new riffs together and blah, blah, blah. So right now, there's just, we're enjoying <laughs> yeah, we're enjoying just being on the road and dealing with that and, and doing things like this and and interviews from the hotels and just the traveling and all that and to start worrying about uh, being creative right now would just be the really wrong time. So when the tour is over, we're going to hopefully <laughs> take about a year off and... Um, And then when we've taken about a year off, then we're going to start worrying about studio album number six. So for me to sit here and tell Eric, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, to tell him what the next album is going to be like would really be a waste of his time and my time and, and all these people's time because honestly, I have no idea. I can tell you that I think we still feel very comfortable about the, um, the direction that we went on the last album in terms of of making the songs a little shorter, a little simpler, a little more kind of groove oriented. So that still feels very comfortable. Those songs, I still think, stand out for us on stage and, and are very comfortable and, and work really well in the live situation. So that still feels good. So, but we'll see. I mean, when we sit down in the summer of, of you know, 1995 or whenever it's going to be and sit down and worry about the next record, then, you know, then I'll uh, call you up and let you know and give you the answer. 
Alors, euh, Eric, qui vient de Gaspé, voulait savoir de quelle direction Metallica prendrait pour son prochain album. Et Lars dit, j'en ai aucune idée. Ils essaient de terminer la tournée. Je pense qu'il leur reste six mois. Et euh, ils n'ont pas vraiment euh, la tête à être créatifs et composer des chansons. Ils disent que lorsque la tournée va être terminée, ils vont prendre un an d'arrêt pour composer un nouvel album. Ils disent qu'ils sont encore très, très contents des chansons du dernier album et qu'elles sont encore très agréables à jouer. Et puis, peut-être en 1995, on va voir un nouvel album de Metallica. On va prendre une question au téléphone. Allô? Quoi? Oui? Um, I just wanted to find out who's your inspiration? Who's your inspiration? Uh, Heineken. Heineken. <laughs> um, I just want to tell you I love you and I was there since the beginning and I hope you have a great concert and have fun in Montreal. Thank you. I'm having it. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Now, um, I mean, in terms of early inspirations um we were really well really i mean probably most of these people have heard this before but i was really inspired by this whole movement that came out of england in like 1979 1980 1981 called the new wave of british heavy metal which was spearheaded by bands like def leppard and iron maiden and motorhead and saxon and this band called diamond head and so on these bands had like uh you know all the bands purple and sabbath and zeppelin and all that what that time considered kind of like dinosaur rock bands all these kind of just old farts that really didn't have it together anymore and there was all these new younger bands coming up that had much more of a street attitude much more a kind of had borrowed a lot of the attitudes from the punk rock movement in terms of just being yourself doing your own thing and playing with a lot more of e energy and so on and those bands really inspired me to to get a band together you know but at this time I was living in California and all this stuff was going on in Europe so It really, I was sitting in California trying to get a European type of band in terms of attitudes and sound together in California, and that's really, that's what happened. Alors, euh, Lars expliquait qu'une de ses influences était un groupe euh, britannique qui s'appelait Diamond Head. Il a aussi admiré, je crois, beaucoup Black Sabbath, euh, Iron Maiden et tout ça. Et euh, il était en Californie, mais il suivait de près ce qui se passait en Europe. On va aller voir un vidéoclip, One, le premier de Metallica. Uh, Lars, what do you think of the whole Seattle movement? You mentioned Alice in Chains. What do you think of the whole Seattle movement? Did you think Metallica would just plow right through it? Plow right through it, huh? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you know, without sounding like, like we're the old far to rock and roll here, we have been around quite a bit longer than the Seattle movement. So uh, it's starting to look like we're going to survive it, isn't it? Um, I like most of those bands. I think the one thing that's weird about this whole Seattle thing is that you lump all these bands together and if you listen to Pearl Jam next to Soundgarden, next to Nirvana, next to Alice in Chains, they have like nothing in common with each other. So what is it Seattle? Okay, they're from Seattle. What they share is certain attitudes and obviously a, a fashion sense, fashion sense, right? But um, I think it's great that you have all these great new But I just look at them as like great hard rock heavy metal bands. Uh, the one thing that's too bad about lumping it in and, and it becoming kind of like the new trendy thing and so on is that when it's trendy and fashionable means that next year it's going to be out the door. So um, and now a lot of people in the industry are already talking about, you know, Seattle's out in Portland, down in Oregon. It's like the new hot thing. So it's like, you know, give me a break. I think there's some great bands coming out of there and I hope those bands will be around for a long time and that they'll outlive this Seattle thing, you know what I mean? And, and that'll just be a, a geographic place. I mean, there's a lot of bands from Seattle that aren't supposedly, you know, it's Queensryche or Metal Church or all these people and it's just because uh, they don't wear flannel shirts, you know. <laughs> But uh, I like most of those bands, like especially Alice in Chains and Soundgarden. Wild Bad Man, they're incredible. Cool. Thanks, well, Lars. Okay, man. Take care. Thanks, Good luck sir. tonight. Alors, Joe demandait à Lars ce qu'il pensait du phénomène de Seattle et de tous ces groupes-là qui sortent de là. Et euh, comme il disait tout à l'heure, euh, Lars est un très grand fan d'Alice in Chains. Mais il disait, c'est un phénomène, mais dans le fond, tout ce qu'ils ont en commun, c'est la ville d'où ils viennent et euh, les vêtements qu'ils portent. Et un trend, souvent, ça s'en va, euh, ça, ça devient démodé après un an chez Queen's Rights, qui sont des groupes qui viennent de là, mais qui sont pas, qui ont pas du tout euh, le même style. Et puis euh, voilà. You have, uh, voilà, yeah. Voilà. 
Yeah. It means um, that's, it. that's it. Yeah. <laughs> you you have I heard a, a collection. You you keep a lot of stuff of Metallica T-shirts, set lists, uh, all kinds of things. I've heard you get a lot of stuff. What's the most special piece you have? <laughs> the house that it's in. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I can't answer that question. Um, no? I have basically, you said most of it, I basically have all of it. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, just, I don't know, ever since we started, I've just been hanging on to, you know, I have every, from the old days, set lists from the first shows from when we supported Saxon up through the original demo tapes that we made the first time and up through a little book that I kept of all the first shows that we played with all the songs that we played. I mean, everything. Tapes from all the early jams in 81, 82, and tapes on the Dave Mustaine audition and so on. <laughs> so uh, I got it all and basically still collect most of it. And that's one of the reasons I'm uh, looking to move soon because I just don't have any more space in my house. So if anybody who got a big house, let me know. <laughs> one day, the, the other guys in the band always kid me about, you know, I'm going to start the, the Metallica Museum. And I think from what I hear, like, every band has one person that's as fanatical about that as me. Like, I know in Def Leppard, Joe Elliott is just like that. He collects just everything. And it's just, I think it's just, it's like, I, you can sit now and, and while all this is going on and, and be real nonchalant about, oh, yeah, you know, success and blah, 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 and try and play it off like it doesn't mean anything. But I think that once it's all gone, You know, in 10, 20, 30 years or whatever, on five minutes, maybe when nobody cares about Lars Ulrich or Metallica or James Hetfield or Inner Sandman or anything, that it will be fun to have those things as just memorabilia. You can show, you know, if we ever get lucky and have grandkids and so on. You know, it's like, here it is. I just, some of the most prized things I have um, that have nothing to do with Metallica, artifacts from my family. I, I guess my whole family isn't very nostalgic, but artifacts from, you know, my family and from my parents' parents and blah, 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 blah. And a lot of that stuff is just fun to sit and dig through. So maybe in 50 years, 100 years, it'll be fun for three or four generations down to look at, you know, what our stupid grand, grand, great granddad or something did with his time. You know, he played in some stupid band called Metallica or something. Who knows? But that at least, I think that's a good answer. <laughs> Alors je demandais à Lars, parce que Lars collectionne tout, euh, tout gardé de Metallica, je demandais quelle était la pièce la plus précieuse, il dit j'ai carrément tout, euh, des, des euh, listes de chansons durant les concerts, des démos, euh, de l'audition de Dave Mustaine, euh, toutes sortes de choses, il garde tout, puis il se dit qu'un jour euh, ben, ça va être intéressant pour les, les, ses enfants, euh, ou même ses petits-enfants, de regarder ça et de voir euh, un jour, quand dans, peut-être dans, il disait dans 20 ans, quand tout le monde va avoir oublié James Hetfield ou Andrew Sandman et tout ça, ben, euh, au moins euh, ses petits-enfants vont pouvoir euh, être témoin de ce qui, est, de ce qui est déjà arrivé. You think I take a long time? <laughs> How do I know that you're exactly translating what I'm saying? Is she? Is she? Yeah? yeah. Okay, all right. You have to trust me. Just, hey, just checking up on you. Yeah. <laughs> all right. On prend une... Quoi? <laughs> oui. Show it in the camera. C'est le temps de la pause commerciale. On revient tout de suite après. <laughs> On est toujours en studio avec Lars Ulrich, le batteur de Metallica. Lars, tomorrow, it's Lover's Day. Ooh. Give us your perception of love. I'm going to give James Hetfield a bunch of roses. Oh, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> uh, give my what? What was the question? Your perception of love. My perception of love? She's over in the back somewhere. Oh. In the control room in there. Hi, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a little early in the day to answer that question. Isn't yeah. it? Um, it's not often I get caught off guard on live TV, but I almost am for a second. Um, yeah. My perception of love, that's being happy, isn't it? Yeah. Being happy. I think love is, is you're happy and you're comfortable and you uh, completely let your guard down. <laughs> yeah. And just, you know, love basically what I'm doing now. And um, just, yeah, you're comfortable and happy and... and I don't know, if there's all these cliches, trust and all that stuff. I mean, you're probably much better at saying that than I am, so. <laughs> 
Now let's get back to rock and roll. Yeah, let's get back to rock and roll. Alors je lui ai demandé euh, sa, perception, sa perception de l'amour parce que demain c'est la Saint Valentin et puis ça l'a débalancé un petit peu. Je pense que euh, il savait pas trop quoi dire. Il dit que demain il va donner plusieurs roses à James Hetfield et puis que autrement ben euh, autrement l'amour ben c'est d'être confortable euh, et d'être heureux. On va prendre une question à l'extérieur. Alors merci beaucoup. Euh, J'ai quelqu'un ici. Bonjour ton nom. Isabelle. Isabelle, de quel endroit? De Brossard. Alors, euh, Isabelle de Brossard, Ulrich, you got that? Yeah. Lars? Isabelle de Brossard. OK, Isabelle, what's your question? Ta question? Je voudrais savoir, après avoir joué deux heures et demie, là, comment, c'est quoi le feeling? Comment ils se sentent après? Lars, she wants to know how you feel after two and a half hours show. Better than I do right now. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> Mieux qu'il ne présentement. <laughs> um... I don't know. We don't play two and a half hour shows. We play three hour shows. Um, How long is it? <laughs> uh, usually pretty, pretty beat. I mean, anybody who's seen us know that we put basically 110% into what we do live on stage. And, you know, what have we done on this tour? About 240 shows. It, it uh, you know, starting to, you know, I feel about six or seven years older than I did two years ago when we started this tour. So the aging process, I think, like speeds up when you're on tour. But uh, so far, so good. The injuries have been kept to minimum. I've had some problems with my shoulder at one point earlier in the tour. But um, apart from that, just when you come off stage, you most of the time feel like uh, that you've been through, you know, a meat grinder or something like that. But it's been a real positive exchange of energies and, and so on with you know 15,000 people and so on it's a it's a very it's a sense of accomplishment just actually making it to the end of the show I don't know if that sounds silly but it really is and just being able to just usually we end with battery or stone cold crazy or one of those songs and at the end of that I just kind of let out a big sigh and just kind of fall into the drum kit and kind of let myself go for about 10 seconds and it's it's a sense of real um Accomplishment. Does that sound silly? No, no. Doesn't? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> non, mais... La personne de Brossard voulait savoir euh, comment James, euh, comment Lars se sentait après un, un concert quand il joue deux heures et demie. Il dit, premièrement, on joue toujours près de trois heures. Et il dit, ben, je me sens euh, comme si j'avais accompli quelque chose de très grand. Il dit, avec le temps, ça fait tellement de spectacles, ça fait tellement de temps qu'ils sont en tournée qu'il y a l'impression que le processus euh, de, de vieillissement a accéléré. Mais il dit qu'il n'est pas, euh, pas trop mal en point. Il y a eu des problèmes à, à l'épaule, tout ça. Mais qu'après un spectacle, la première chose qu'il fait, c'est qu'il s'écroule sur sa batterie et puis euh, il reste là du second puis vraiment satisfait après. On va prendre une question au téléphone. Qui est là? Oui, salut. Salut? Il y a une question pour Lars. Oui? Hi, Lars. What's happening? The greatest band in the world, man. Who? Uh, the question is... Okay. <laughs> what? No, just kidding. Just being silly. Thank you. Hey, yeah, man. Uh, my question is, what do you think about Montreal fans? Montreal fans? I think they're probably about the best in Canada. <laughs> I think you guys are going to need some new windows here pretty soon. But, uh, <laughs> um, it's good. Up here, um, as opposed to the States, I think the, the audiences up here in Canada are a lot more like they are in Europe. They're a lot more, um, I think, attentive to, you know, down in America, you know, rock and roll, which in some cases can be great, but sometimes it's, it's just nice, you know, here and in Europe, you feel that the kids are maybe a little more involved and a little more aware of what you're doing and kind of checking out the whole thing it's not as easy maybe to get away with you know down and when you do like 175 shows in america sometimes it can become you, know, you just do like this and you become a little too easy do you know what i mean to get a reaction out of people and i think it's always a good reality check to go back to europe and, and so on and come up here and, and where you really feel that you're not getting away with anything that you're really earning everything that you're doing do you know what i mean so the fans up here great and it's uh god listen to him and <laughs> and it's uh yesterday was great and tonight's gonna be even better right what can i say 
<rire> Alors là, je dis que les fans de Montréal sont probablement les meilleurs, les meilleurs fans du Canada. Et qu'il y a une différence entre les fans peut-être d'ici et d'Europe, et euh, si les compare à ceux des États-Unis, vu qu'aux États-Unis c'est plus facile à conquérir le public, mais qu'en France ou en Europe et ici sont peut-être plus euh, plus difficiles et tout ça. Et puis je pense que la réaction à l'extérieur a fait euh, plaisir à l'heure. On va prendre une pause commerciale, on revient tout de suite après. I'd like to know, out of the concert, after the show, if you're, uh, you spend a lot of time with James, Jason, and Kirk, and I guess you do, but do you go out a lot together and... Well, <laughs> um, when we've been on the road as long as we have, believe me, it, uh, the fact that the four of us are still together, <laughs> the fact that the four of us get on as well as we do right now, I think is a minor miracle, especially with... Um, If you look at all these other bands from, you know, Guns to Anthrax to Motley to Poison to all these bands that keep going through members, most of that, I think, is a result of just things, friction that happens on tour and so on. So when we are on the road, we don't necessarily hang out, based, you know, the 21 hours that we're not on stage together. You know, we uh, basically, all four of us go off in four different directions. Over the, the last few years, we've all um i think it's become more and more apparent how different we are as people the four of us and i think we're much more comfortable with that fact now than we were before and i think we're much more uh respect and mm -hmm. some funny words to use but we're, we respect each other a lot more me and james are very very different as people and we do very different things on days off and stuff like that but it really It just unites what we do around Metallica and makes that even stronger that, that all four of us can bring different things to it. So to get back to your, your question, we don't really spend a lot of time together, um, especially in the beginning of a tour. I mean, you know, you haven't been on the road for a couple of years. And it's like every night you go out and drink and yeah, and male bonding and, you know, all this kind of stuff. But when, I mean, when you've been on the we've been on the road now for a year and nine months almost. And it's uh, it's like. You know, it's a, that's a minor miracle in itself. <laughs> and uh, uh, so it, the fact that um, I think one of the things that just has made this still work is the fact that we respect each other much more, but we don't really spend that much time together because we're always, you know, t traveling. And so when we finally get a few minutes, we usually run in four different directions. <laughs> Je demandais à Lars s'il était euh, très proche des autres membres de Metallica, s'il passait beaucoup de temps avec eux après le spectacle. Et puis, euh, il me disait que non, il, normalement, ils partent chacun dans leur direction. Et puis, euh, il m'a dit là. Good. <laughs> And, um, et aussi, euh, c'est sûrement pour cette raison-là que Metallica est resté ensemble après euh, toutes ces années. C'est que justement, ils font chacun de leur côté leurs choses. Et si on compare à d'autres groupes comme Poison One Tracks, je me donnais un exemple, et le, 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 le personnel, les, le groupe euh, change tout le temps de, de, de batteur, de musicien et tout ça. Et puis, euh, c'est ça. Puis, il disait même à Mira que si on a réussi euh, à, à, à endurer cette longue tournée-là ensemble, je pense que Lars Van Qu'est-ce qu'on fait après? Now we have to go outside, okay? To some of all the guys outside freezing their asses off. Okay? Thanks, Lars. You're a very uh, good in here video. Nice and warm. <laughs> anyway. Uh, bonjour, ton nom? Steve. Steve, de quel endroit? Longueuil. Steve from Longueuil, Lars. Ta question? What's up? Okay. Uh, What's up? <laughs> okay. What's up? <laughs> It's music plus rap. Après, What's up? Après. Ouais. Après, la, après la mort de Cliff, euh, avez-vous pensé lâcher le groupe Puis aussi, pourquoi Jason nous a fait couper les cheveux Ok. Il y a deux questions là. Après la mort de Cliff, avez-vous pensé lâcher le groupe Et la deuxième partie Pourquoi Jason a coupé ses cheveux Voilà. Parce qu'il voulait l'attention. Ok. 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 Okay, enough Jason jokes here. Um, what was the first one, Cliff? What was it? Yeah, so when after Cliff died, did you think the band would um, stop being together? It it was not something that we thought a lot about. I think that the natural thing. I mean, it, it's very strange talking about it seven years after because I really can't remember specifically what was going through our heads. But Metallica, I think, had always been about 
pushing and, and going against the grain and so on and obviously there had been certain problems in the past but there had obviously never been anything of that magnitude but I don't think as cliche as it sounds Cliff would have wanted us definitely to carry on of course and it just felt like we just needed to continue and, and now we had one more reason to do it which was for Cliff so what we did back then was very quickly we didn't sit around for you know six months and blah 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 waste a lot of time we just basically about two weeks later we started auditioning bass players and we're back honoring dates that uh, we actually already had, had on the schedule uh, as far as Jason's haircut, um, there are different theories. One of them is that he had a fight with a lawnmower and the lawnmower lost. Another one is that he was starting to lose his hair and he uh, beat nature to it, although that one doesn't hold a lot of, of value amongst us, uh, that his big hero is the singer from Pantera. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, no. I, I mean, <laughs> sorry, Jason. I love you. You know that. Um, no. I mean, the real, the real thing is he just wanted a change, and I think that he was just pissed off with, with his hair, and it was time to, uh, to do something different. And uh, the funny thing is that he actually has his hair at home in, uh, in a plastic bag. And, uh, yeah, yeah, so I think it, that and the tube of crazy glue, and he could be back to Jason the old way again in one minute. So. <laughs> Bon, mais d'abord, euh, on a eu comme question, lorsque Cliff est décédé, c'était l'ancien bassiste de Metallica, lorsque Cliff est décédé, est-ce que Metallica a pensé arrêter faire la musique? Et euh, Laura se disait, c'est difficile de se rappeler ce qu'on s'est dit à cette époque-là, mais il n'y a jamais été question, euh, chose certaine, d'interrompre, de, euh, de faire la musique. Et puis, il a dit que ça n'a pas pris beaucoup de temps, ils ont passé des auditions, ils ont tout de suite trouvé un nouveau bassiste, et il dit que Cliff, chose certaine, ils sont convaincus que c'est ce que Cliff aurait souhaité, que Metallica continue à faire la musique. Et puis, on voulait savoir aussi pourquoi Jason, euh, Jason nous cède le bassiste de Metallica, pourquoi il s'est coupé les cheveux, parce que les cheveux complètement euh, rasés maintenant. Et puis, euh, Lars nous expliquait que c'était soit parce que son idole, c'est le chanteur de Pantera, ou soit parce que il, euh, il perdait ses cheveux puis il savait plus trop quoi faire. Et or, or last but not least, maybe he wanted to help get our credibility back. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> ou peut-être euh, Metallica a trouvé de la crédibilité. Mais il dit que Jason a même gardé ses cheveux et euh, qu'un jour, on pourrait très bien revoir Jason avec son ancienne coupe de cheveux. Il pourrait euh, la recréer comme ça. On va prendre une question ici. On a un fan de Metallica hello. qui s'avance. Hello. Sit down. <laughs> How are you doing? Oh, fine. Say hello. 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 You okay. Um, cucumber or carrot? <laughs> or, no? Okay. Okay, what's your best advice to, uh, that you can give? Il lui met une truc sur la tête. Wow. Hey, you got a Metallica hat on. Okay, oh, what's the best advice you can give to a young drummer like me? <laughs> Quit. No. <laughs> um, I think the best advice is to, um, well, it depends. What, what, what do you want to do? Yeah, you want to end up like, <laughs> yeah, like me? <laughs> um, then you got to practice a lot, <laughs> which I never did. No, which that should be pretty obvious. Um, just keep at it. I uh, didn't take a lot of lessons when I was younger and I think there came a point after a few years where I realized that I probably should have taken more lessons than I did. So without telling anybody what to do, I think it's always good to have a couple years of understanding real basic elements of drumming and just reading music and so on. And because uh, I had to go back and relearn all that stuff after Metallica was already going, which is pretty much a waste of time. So uh, just get it, spend a couple years learning and understanding the basics and that, and then just go for it, keep it up. Maybe you'll take my place in a couple years. <laughs> What's your name? Uh, Anthony. Anthony. Anthony voulait savoir uh, comment il pourrait faire pour uh, devenir batteur, et puis Lars lui a expliqué, ben, pratique, c'est beaucoup de travail, fais pas comme moi, j'ai pas pratiqué. Et il dit, c'est vraiment beaucoup d'heures de travail, tout ça, puis il dit, un jour, ça peut-être devenir uh, assez bon pour me remplacer. Merci, Anthony. Okay. Anthony, you're, you're on live TV. Is there anything you want to tell the world? <laughs> What do you think of President Clinton? <laughs> Oh, okay. All right. Okay. All right. He doesn't know. I'd like to um, to go back just uh, for a minute to uh, what happened at the stadium last summer. Um, do you think that a riot like that will make a lot of people say, "Oh yeah, that's it. Heavy metal music equals violence," and uh, you know, like, what do you think? Well, of course, it gives everybody that already has those kind of negative attitudes about hard rock more fuel for their fire. 
I think that luckily those incidents are so isolated, but I guess what pisses me off is the the media, the general media has a real one-sided approach to this. They'll always, you know, something happens in Montreal like this and it'll just become the biggest deal in the whole world, but nobody, for instance, will ever talk about the 25 shows that Guns N' Roses Metallica did that went off without any incident where thousands of people just went home really happy. All the city managers and the police people and the people that own the buildings would come up to me and to the people in guns afterwards and say great show it blah 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 and we're so happy there was you know that never gets reported it's only once in a while when something like that blows up so obviously it's, it's real unfortunate that that gives all these people fuel for fire but you know every the whole hard rock community i think is being watched so closely all the time that sure there's going to be once in a while some mistake that happens. The other thing that really pisses me off is that everybody always gets lumped in together. You know, you have like, okay, heavy metal did this. It's not that Axl Rose did that or, you know, uh, Poison or Slayer. It's like when it's, something happens within the community of heavy metal, that it makes everybody look bad even though that, you know, 99% of the bands didn't have anything to do with it, you know what I mean? But everybody kind of takes a blow for it, which is, it's just a reality, but it's one thing that can be kind of annoying because you, you know, we try and always honor our commitments and we try and, and always play the game real straight with, with the things that we have to do and, and, and so on. And it's just when you have certain people that go out and screw things up, on behalf of everybody else, it can really piss you off a lot. Read between the lines, if you know what I mean, so. Alors je demandais à Lars, euh, suite aux événements du Stade Olympique l'année dernière, s'il euh, y a justement des gens qui diraient, bon, mais ben, c'est sûr, euh, le heavy metal et la violence, euh, ça va ensemble. Il disait, mais c'est ce qui se passe souvent euh, quand il y a plusieurs spectacles de rock, comme euh, les 25 que Guns N' Roses et Metallica ont fait ensemble, qui ont été très bien. Personne ne va en parler, aussitôt qu'il arrive un incident, les médias sautent là-dessus et en parlent. Et souvent, euh, ce qu'il n'aime pas aussi, c'est qu'on va mettre le blâme sur la musique heavy metal en particulier, au lieu de juste dire, bon, mais à cause de tel groupe ou de tel événement, eh bien, il s'est passé ça. Et puis, euh, ça, ça l'embête un petit peu. Now, Lars, do you think there's going to be a live album made out of this tour? <laughs> um, <coughs> yeah, actually, we were supposed to, um, we were supposed to have recorded last night and tonight for uh, some live stuff, but... Uh, some technical difficulties and so we're going to do it down in Mexico next in two weeks instead but uh, we are sitting on um, two shows from San Diego earlier in the tour uh, on video and audio and uh, we're going to record a bunch more shows just for the audio side of it so probably yeah probably towards the end of this year there should be some kind of live package of some sort I'm not really sure we've talked about maybe like a package that has videos and CDs in it, but you can't buy, buy them separately. Just maybe do like a limited edition. I think the days of live albums as such are pretty much over, you know, in terms of, you know, made in Japan and, and what do you want? Relax. I think we're going to the okay. end. You what? We're going to the end? Well, let me just finish what I was saying. Yeah, sure. Uh, just, you know, the days of live albums like such are really over because now that the video has, uh, video has really taken over so if you notice now when people release live packages all the emphasis is always on the video not really on the on the audio side of it so it, it's it's a very different thing than it was 10 15 years ago and i think that we're trying to make the best of both worlds maybe do a package where where the whole thing comes lumped in as one so like i said we're sitting on stuff from san diego and we're going to re be recording five shows down in mexico city in about two weeks and that should hopefully serve us sometime in the fall alors cet automne probablement un album live de metallica un album fait lors de cette tournée lars thank you very much for being here i have a little present for you it's a music plus t-shirt black of course Is there any other color? <laughs> no, great. No, no, that, it, black is the only color. Right? Great, thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Merci aux gens à l'intérieur. Merci à tout le monde à l'extérieur d'être venu faire un tour aujourd'hui. Voilà. On se laisse sur un...